Okay, so um, today I'll uh, talk about liquid crystal elastomers. Um, and I made up this talk really late last night, so its contents will be as surprising to me as to you. Um, before I start, are there any questions about stuff I talked about yesterday? Okay, good. So, one thing I forgot to mention that I, I did want to mention, um, when I talked about this little um, transition of uh, the contact region of the ruler on the cylinder, we had this uh, cubic equation for the free energy. Um, So on. Uh, th this is really analogous to the mean field theory of uh, the percolation. Right. I just thought it may be worth mentioning that, where you have basically uh, conductivity versus uh, density, and you have pretty much the same story that it's some critical density you have uh, a transition, and again, uh, interestingly, you get a finite slope there. So, if anyone's interested in seeing more of this, you can look this up. And I think this was worked done by Tom Lubensky as well as other people. Okay, so, talk about liquid crystal isomers. So, basically, we talked about liquid crystals, and uh, <coughs> there was a kind of a a thing that I ask you to remember, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover that in a sec, and then today I want to talk about isotropic elastomers, then about liquid crystal elastomers and gels, and stuff about photo actuation and energy generation and so on, a little bit about simulations, and that's it. And then uh, tomorrow I'll talk about soft motors in, uh, in general. Okay, so the things I ask you to remember were, was basically the notion that uh, you have some assembly of anisotropic particles. You can stick a, a unit vector along the symmetry axis, and you can define an order parameter tensor this way. And most of the time, two of the eigenvalues are the same, so it's uniaxial, and you can write it like this, where you have basically just a scalar and the distinguished eigenvector, which is the director that I didn't put here. Okay, and then the oh, there it is. Um, and uh, the, then the point is, is that the, the free energy uh, looks like this um, with this um, sign changing quadratic term and uh, know, something is missing here. Um, but basically it looks like this and it's strongly temperature dependent. And uh, if you have an electric field, then the term looks like this. And, and the key point here is that um, the molecules want to align with the electric field. So you minimize the energy by having n parallel to E. I think those are kind of the main ideas. And, and roughly these coefficients here uh, are just the you know kT per molecule is the energy density. And that will turn out to be relevant. The other thing I did mention last time is that the transition temperature, uh, which, which sort of comes out when you look at energy and entropy, uh, is proportional to the number density of particles. So this is just some oscillator strength of, of, uh, of in, in, in the molecules, but basically this is uh, proportional to the number density. Okay, that's it. So uh, marching on. Um, so liquid crystal elastomers are basically anisotropic rubbers with combined features of liquid crystals and elastic solids. So it kind of brings these two aspects together. Um, and so there's solid liquid crystals, and that's interesting. And uh, uh, the, there are two heroes in the story. One is uh, Pierre Gilles de Jean, who really uh, did some magnificent work, and he first proposed that such materials would be interesting. And uh, Heino Finkelman, who lives in Freiburg, uh, is the synthetic chemist who first made these materials. 
So these are two uh, luminary figures. And uh, so the question is, why even think about putting these things together? Well, they're both, they're both soft materials. And liquid crystals, as we now know, respond to almost any kind of stimulus. Uh, but they're liquids, they can support stress. Um, on the other hand, rubbers are elastic solids, uh, which can support stress, so that's interesting. But they tend to respond only to stress. So it, it kind of makes sense to bring them together, because they're so and here is a, a kind of a typical uh, <coughs> liquid crystal elastomer, and this demo is, a, is something of an icon now. And this is material made by Heino Finkelman, and this is a monodomain uh, pneumatic elastomer. And you know, here are the dimensions, but five centimeters long, five millimeters, and uh, maybe uh, 300 microns thick. And uh, when you heat it, it, it contracts. Now, most things, when you, when you heat them, they change. You know, they, get, uh, they expand. Uh, this guy contracts. But typically, coefficients of thermal expansion are really, really small. Um, so, although I remember once, so most things, when you heat them, they expand, right? But having to do with the ad harmonicity of the potential. But, once we had an outreach program and somebody wrote to us and said, uh, I know that most things expand, but when I wash my sweater, it shrinks. <laughs> <laughs> Why? That's an interesting thing to think about. Okay, so this thing shrinks, and the amazing thing is you change the temperature by uh, maybe 10 degrees um, Celsius, and, and you get this enormous change in length. So this is just an indication of how responsive these materials are and why I think they have such a uh, great potential for actual efforts and other things. So now, uh, let's forge ahead and try to understand what happens. So, um, elastic solids, so you can imagine that you have a material and you, you choose a material point somewhere. And this is a Lagrangian coordinate and then you have some deformation. Uh, the point moves to somewhere else in space, so the displacement vector, and you can define uh, simple strain tensor, which is just the uh, symmetric uh, uh, derivative of uh, R alpha with respect to x uh, over x is your lab frame. And so there are more sophisticated uh, strains, but this will suffice for uh, what I want to do. And then it turns out that uh, the, for incompressible materials, the free energy density is just uh, Young's modulus times the strain squared, the strain that I've just shown you before, and uh, maybe mo most importantly, uh, Young's modulus is just three halves rho kT, where rho is the crosslink density of the rubber. So that's a really useful piece of information because you can measure Young's modulus and immediately you get the crosslink density or vice versa. Okay, so that's, that's the simplest picture of um, simp simplest picture of rubbers and uh, where to go from here. Now if you have um, if you have uh, a stress that you apply, then you have to add the stress term, just like you added the electric field term to the free energy of the crystal. You add the stress, and then if you minimize the free energy, you find that the, uh, the strain is uh, equal to the stress in the ratio of just Young's modulus, which is uh, what we expect. And no. So you can uh, just take a, a piece of rubber, you can apply the stress and you get the corresponding strain. And for most rubbers, like rubber bands, uh, Young's modulus is about 10 to the 6 pascals. So they are fairly, fairly soft materials. Um, now, uh, we have to talk about random walks. And uh, I thought I would take a minute just to go through this simple exercise to try to figure out what the distribution um, 
of the distance between the ends of a freely jointed polymer chain. So I'm sure most of you have seen this, but let's maybe just step through it quickly. And let's still look at 1B because it's really simple. So imagine that you have a random walk in one dimension and you want to know the probability that you have traveled a certain distance. So suppose that the random walker takes n steps um, and if the steps were distinguishable then you could do this in n factorial ways but you have uh, let's say l steps to the left and these are all the same and you have r steps to the right and these are all the same so this is a number of ways that you could do this random walk now what you're interested in is the displacement you're interested in the um, difference between uh, let's call it d of those not the uh, that's called M, the <coughs> excess number of steps to the right. So you have uh, R steps to the right and L steps to the left. And we also know that N is equal to R plus L. Okay, so far so good. Um, now what I want to do is I want to say that L is equal to um, N minus N over 2 and R is equal to N plus N over 2. And then we'll substitute in here and we got this grand result the number of ways we can uh, have a displacement of n steps to the right is um, n minus m over 2 factorial n plus m over 2 factorial. And so if we now take the logarithm of this, okay, so this is proportional to the probability of having traveled that distance. So um, if I take the logarithm of this quantity uh, and uh, we just use the CUDA Sterling's approximation, then this becomes um, m log n, and then we have two terms which is n minus m over 2 log n minus m over 2. And the same thing here, n minus n over 2. And then if you do a Taylor series expansion, you pull out, a, get rid of the 2, factor of the n, then you have 1 minus m over n, uh, oops, oh, this is a box. Uh, and uh, 1 plus. Uh, m over n, do Taylor series expansion, and I won't put in all the steps, but when everything is said and done, then you end up, and it, it's fairly easy to see how that will happen, you're going to end up with an m squared over n, and that's really the important thing. So this is equal to some stuff which is not relevant, and m squared over n. All right. So that means that the probability so the probability of traveling a distance of m to the right is just some constant times e to the m squared of, I think I better have a minus sign here somewhere minus m squared over n. Okay, simple. So this is the story in 1D, and if you do this in 3D, then you get a factor of 3 halves here, and it's a little more complicated, but you can see how this thing plays out. Now suppose that you have 
a step length let's call it LS okay so that's that's now an actual distance then you can write this as e to the m times ls squared, you multiply the top and bottom by that, you get then the distance traveled basically divided by the number of step lengths squared times n. And, ah, oh, very good, thank you. And, uh, So finally, the probability in 3D that the ends are separated by a vector r uh, is some constant times e to the, I guess it is a 3 halves here, it doesn't matter. There's an r squared over, and if you multiply a step length by n, then you get the total length of the chain. So you basically get the total length of the chain times a step length the denominator. And one way of writing this is to write it as e to the, <coughs> have a vector here and you dot it with itself, but in general you could imagine that your walk is biased and you're not walking same step length in all directions. You can put it here an inverse step length tensor and you have then an expression like this. And so this will then describe the end-to-end -end displacement when you may have different step lengths in different directions. Okay. So Back to the uh, overhead. So, <clears throat> in the case of liquid crystals, uh, people have proposed that the step length tensor, and I'm sorry I've used the wrong notation, but the step length tensor should be anisotropic. It should have an isotropic part and an anisotropic part, which is different in different directions. And now you can see that if you have a polymer consisting of messages, consisting of rods, so the rod, liquid crystal forming rod, linked to another one, and so on, you can see that if, um, if these rods are all aligned, then you tend to go further in that direction than in the transverse direction. On the other hand, when uh, orientation order disappears, Q goes to zero, then you want the step length tensor to be isotropic. So this is the, the simplest structure that you could have to somehow incorporate the anisotropy of the mesogens uh, with, the, with the polymer network. And this was proposed by Warner and Terentia um, originally. So, all right, now, so we know a little bit about elastomers, a little bit about the crystals. So now let's uh, try to put these things together. So, and this is what Dejean originally proposed. He just said, take the liquid crystal free energy, so all the terms in here, including, I put the electric field and I kept that. Um, put in the elastomer free energy, and then you can have some coupling term. And the simplest thing you can do is to make a scalar and happily, the order parameter tensor, second rank, strain is second rank, so you can form a scalar from this, and then there will be some coefficient of fun. So the free energy is the sum of the free energy of liquid crystal and the elastic solid, and this new coupling term. And then one has to meditate a little bit about, um, about this coefficient, so it has to have units of energy density, so it makes sense. That, uh, that it should be more or less proportional to um, Q. 
kt, it should be essentially kt times the crosslink density. But um, it's also possible that, um, well, I'll come back to that. But it, 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 it turns out that it's also proportional to the step length and isotropy. So if, for example, if the system becomes isotropic, the step length and isotropy disappears, you would expect this coupling to disappear as well. Okay, and, and, and here is now the punchline that I think one can understand all of the key features of the universal isomers by simply noting that the effect of liquid crystalline order, that is this Q, on the rubber, uh, sorry, the effect of liquid crystalline order on the rubber is just the same as an external stress. So here's the here's the <coughs> rubber free energy, and look how the stress appears. It just appears as the coefficient of the strain in the linear term. And it's exactly the same as this. <coughs> so the, any change in the order parameter is exactly the same as applying an external stress to the rubber. And uh, as far as the liquid crystal is concerned, uh, this strain appears just the same way as the electric field does. It has exactly the same effect. <coughs> so if you think in those terms, you can, you can predict pretty well um, how this system is going to behave. So, so if you change Q, um, then you have suddenly applied a stress to your rubber, right? A new stress will appear here, and that's going to cause a shape change. And uh, so, for example, heating will cause a contraction along the director. And so here's where the relative magnitudes become important. Uh, this term here is the kT times the number density of the molecules, which is a lot bigger than the crosslink density. So this term is much, much bigger than gamma. And so if the liquid crystal free energy wants to change, the rubber pretty much has to fall. No other way. Um, and uh, on the other hand, if you look at uh, what happens if you now apply mechanical strain to the system, it has the same effect as an electric field. And again, it's interesting to think about the numbers. So this thing here is more or less just Young's modulus, which is about 10 to the fifth, let us say. Uh, and then uh, you can ask yourself what sort of electric field that corresponds to. Now, if you work out the energy density in here, um, it's not that, not that difficult, I guess. So, <coughs> I know, delta epsilon, maybe even epsilon naught times E squared. So, this energy density, so this guy is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, so this is 10 to the minus 11. This is roughly 10, as indicated yesterday. And the biggest electric field you can make in a lab is what? Seventeen Tesla. Hmm? In a lab? Yeah. Seventeen Tesla. Uh, electric field. Oh. Uh, uh. I mean, you get sparks. Is is what happens. So it turns out that. Definitely, the best you can do is what a million volts per meter or volt per micron. After that, you get direct equation. So this is about 10 to the minus 10 to the plus 12. So this comes out to I don't know 100. And uh, you can see on the other hand. So so this is energy density, right? This is Pascal. So. Then you compare that with Young's modulus, which is 10 to the fifth. So this is huge. So the effect of strain is the same as if you applied an enormous electric field, much bigger than what you can do. And what the electric field does is it aligns the director. So when you apply a strain to the rubber, it aligns the director. OK. So I think in the simple way, one can have a pretty good intuitive sense of uh, 
how these things work. And uh, so the key feature then is just this uh, nice coupling between the order parameter tensor and the mechanical strain. Okay, now there's another interesting feature of these materials that's worth mentioning, uh, which goes like this. So let's have another look. Um, at uh, this coupling term and the first term in the elastic part, one can uh, one can cleverly uh, complete the square, right? I mean, here we have a square term, a linear term, so we can just complete the square. And uh, the important, okay, and so that gives you another quadratic term. We change this a little bit on the issue. The main point is this that. <clears throat> this guy can kill the strain. If you take a piece of rubber, you have to do work because in the free energy you have this um, Young's modulus times E squared. But here you can essentially compensate for the strain by just changing Q. Now over here, uh, the only thing that appears in Q, in Q squared, is just the eigen value squared. So if you don't change the degree of order, nothing happens here. But here you can change the director, just the orientation of the dramatic director, and you can compensate for strength. And so this gives rise to soft elasticity, which means you can take these materials and you can stretch them, and there's no free energy cost because n can rotate basically to compensate for the strain. And uh, this idea in a more general context uh, was proposed by Lubensky back in 89 and then it was realized here. So, so what you see in these materials is uh, if uh, of course the, the, the strain is uh, perpendicular to the director then you can have, uh, for a region, essentially a plateau where it costs you no energy to reform the material. And then when you run out of uh, possibilities, then it picks up and behaves like a regular rubber. So it's a kind of an interesting and an unusual uh, aspect, really coming from this uh, coupling. And uh, it makes these materials unique. And maybe they are really useful for certain applications, such as uh, vibration damping, for example, or something like that. Okay, now, uh, samples. Uh, what do these things look like? Uh, so one simple way of a uh, simple cartoon uh, that, that helps one to visualize sort of what happened inside, you can imagine then that the um, battery was uh, you, you, you can imagine this one too. All right. Um, you can imagine that uh, you have uh, messages in the main chain, and uh, this is the director. And you can imagine that if you increase the orientational order, you will have an expansion in this direction, contraction this way. And if you do the opposite, you start to disorder these guys. These crossings will get. Uh, pull together, you get a contraction and expansion the other way. These materials, ordinary isotropic rubbers, and these materials, thank you, um, they both conserve volume to a really good approximation. So if you have a length change one way, you have to compensate for it by corresponding length change with the opposite side in the perpendicular directions. And uh, those are interested in chemistry. Uh, typically, uh, uh, siloxane is used as the main chain, and then one can uh, have some sort of typical liquid crystal-like molecules uh, either as part of the main chain or with pendant groups. And there's lots of different ways you can do it. You can have uh, side chains that are put end on, or side on, lots of different ways. And then you have some kind of cross-linker to make this uh, into, a, into, a, into a network. Are there any materials that uh, uh, actually have a larger, they actually expand? 
perpendicular, even plane perpendicular to the United Arab Emirates, pretty negative coefficient. Yeah, yeah, there are materials that have, that, that have, yeah, that have a negative uh, anisotropy of the step like yeah. the behavior. Yeah, so you, you can think in one case that the <laughs> polymer makes an oblate, uh, a prolate uh, ellipsoid, basically, right. which would be positive anisotropy or an oblate or. So how do they make, what's, what's the trick, what is the, what is its microstructure, what, what are they last number of them? Uh, it, it, it depends on, it depends on how the mesogen is incorporated into the network. Mm -hmm. um, and, and often it has to, I mean, it, it's, it, of course if you just had disks, for example, mm -hmm. that were, uh, you know, linked at the periphery, then they would obviously have a, a negative uh, step mm -hmm. like an isotopy. But in fact, practically, uh, what tends to happen is that the, the way that the <coughs> messenger is joined to the main chain, you know, so it determines the angle. So even if you have a rod, uh, which is the messenger, and it's, it's linked to the main chain in such a way that the main chain wants to be perpendicular because of the linkage, mm -hmm. then you can end up having an oblate. Uh, of the polymer chain configuration. And I just wanted to mention how, how one would make uh, these materials. So typically you put the components together in some solvent and you can, uh, you can just cast them, you can just put them on a flat surface. But it turns out that you don't get very uniform uh, thickness samples that way. So typically you mix them together and you put them in a centrifuge. And if you have a centrifuge uh, uh, with a sort of a, a, a nice, uh, a, a nice smooth uh, perimeter of the chamber, then you can get a very nice uh, uniform kind of rubber band. And so that's how one makes these. You, you make a, a Teflon chamber and uh, you put your solvent in there, you spin it like crazy, the liquid spins up along the wall and then you evaporate the solvent. And so the thing then will cross-link, but it will still be swollen, then you take out the sample, which is partially polymerized. Well, you have a lot of solvent in there, so it's not liquid crystalline, it's just, just a swollen isotropic rubber with, with lots of solvent in it. And then when the solvent evaporates, the, the messagens start to bump into each other, and you start to make liquid crystal domains and basically what you have is you have orientational order starting in different places in your sample and they don't talk to each other because they're starting in different places. So if you don't do anything then you have a, a polydomain sample. So typically one hangs a very small weight on these uh, strips as the solvent evaporates and that's enough to have the little domains line up and you get a single big monodome. So that's how you make them, and uh, they uh, they look just like transparent I don't know, <coughs> rubber bands made of jelly or something, except they're beautifully uh, anisotropic. They're biofringent. So you put them between cross polarizers. It looks just like a biofringent crystal, except you can find knots in it. Okay, so that's what they look like, um, and. Uh, and then if you change the shape of these things, it changes the orientational order and changes all the physical properties that depend on the order. So I showed this picture before. This is a, this is a cholesteric elastomer. So this is made of these uh, chiral molecules that wind up into a helix. And the helix axis is uh, coming up here. And if you stretch this sample, then you're basically changing the pitch, the helical pitch. And as I said, this is a photonic band gap material, and so you're really changing uh, the band. You can see the change in color, but you're changing where the band gap is. And then if you uh, pump these things uh, with a laser, then you can get this thing to laze because it's band gap material. It will laze at the band edge. So all you have to do is, um, is uh, put some uh, dye in here, pump it, and you have a beautiful laser line coming up. 
And if you stretch the rubber, then you can move the laser line to whatever you want. So it's a kind of a tunable rubber laser. Uh, so you can do all sorts of uh, amusing things. Now, <clears throat> it's also interesting to take these things and hang them in, the, in, uh, in an atmosphere where you have solvent uh, vapors. And, uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the transition temperature of the pneumatic uh, goes as the number density of mesogens. And if you have solvent vapor going into the material, it starts to swell, then this thing decreases, the critical temperature decreases, and that has pretty much the same effect as heating up the sample. So <clears throat> here's, a, here's a sample. Um, which is a more domain pneumatic sample, and when you start to expose it to chloroform vapor, in this case, the chloroform vapor reduces the degree of order, so this gives rise to a stress, and it changes its shape, it contracts in this direction, it contracts quite a bit here. But it turns out that because now you have a lot of solvent in there, it also changes in this polydomain structure, that's why it's white. And then if even more goes in there, then it becomes isotropic, because now your transition temperature has, uh, has gone way down, and you're above it, becomes isotropic, and then you just have a swollen, um, swollen isotropic uh, sample. And uh, you, can make, uh, you can make a sort of the equivalent of a bimetallic strip, so there's uh, an RTV uh, slab with a pneumatic slab on top, and if you expose this to a vapor, then you get this big length change, and the thing curls up, so you can make sort of a chemical vapor-driven actuator this way. And now here's really a nice example of a similar thing, um, where this sample is made so that the director is perpendicular to the surface on one end and parallel on the other. And it turns out that uh, this is made of, of a hydrogen bonded material and uh, water vapor will disrupt the hydrogen bonding. And so it will again decrease the pneumatic order and you get strain and deformation. So uh, this is a little movie. So, so this, there's water down here, and when you bring this thing uh, where the water vapor density is high, you can see you get a really big deformation. Again, driven by the same. Uh, so you expand the top and contract the bottom? Um, you get the pressure of expansion. That's right. So, so this guy here will contract. Uh, yeah, so this structure is nice because when you change the degree of order, the two pieces kind of work in tandem. So if you reduce the degree of order, this guy contracts. And this, there'll be a contraction this way, but it must be compensated for by an expansion in the other direction. So this guy expands, this and contract, and it bends quite a lot. But what's happening? Why is diffusing into it? Right. So just, just water molecules diffuse into it, disrupts the hydrogen bond, which reduces the degree of order. Order. Hmm? It decreases the order. Right, right. So, but it gives you some sense of how large the deformation is and how quickly this mechanism works. Okay, and then, uh, then you can do other things. Uh, uh, Mark Kuzik uh, made this uh, uh, detector where basically you have a, a very, very small lubricous elastomer in the Fabry Perot cavity, and uh, by, uh, <clears throat> by changing the, the dimensions of the, of the elastomer, you can change the resonance frequency of the cavity, so you can measure light intensity very sensitively, you can cascade these things, so you can make it even more sensitive. So there's all sorts of uh, funny applications that one can have. Now, uh, in addition to, in addition to uh, cross-linked elastomers, uh, one can make gels, and uh, gels are just uh, a liquid dispersed in a continuous solid phase. 
And one can make different uh, scenarios. You can have a liquid elastomer with isotropic solvent, like I showed you, or isotropic elastomer with liquid crystal solvent, which I didn't show you, but it's doable. Or you can have liquid crystal elastomer with crystal solvent, and so on. So you got all kinds of gels. And they're kind of interesting because uh, you're reducing the effect of the network, uh, and you're changing some of the physical properties. Now, Julie Cornfield's group uh, at Caltech came up with a really nice idea um, where they took tri-block copolymers with a long sort of middle section and, uh, and mesogenic side chains and polystyrene end blocks. And now it turns out that polystyrene uh, is soluble in typical liquid crystals like 5CB when they're on the isotropic phase but they become insoluble in the nomadic phase. It turns out that not many things are soluble in the nomadic phase. The molecules want to be side by side, they don't like anybody else in there. So people have been trying to put nanoparticles into liquid crystals, and it doesn't work very well because liquid crystal just doesn't like a foreign thing in there. It's going to be together. All right, so in the isotropic phase, like with a nice isotropic solution of this liquid crystal and this polymer. But when you cool it down into the nomadic phase, the end blocks of the time block become insoluble, and so they microphase separate. And it is these microphase separated regions that act as crosslinks. So this is not a crosslink in the sense of having covalent bonds, but it's a physical crosslink. But you get a crosslink solid just the same. So in the isotropic phase, here's the liquid crystal, all random. Here's the tri block with the blue polystyrene ends. Um, and so this is just a kind of viscous, goopy liquid. But when you cool it down, the polystyrene all phase separates, forming these little balls. And now you have an amatic gel, which is now a proper solid. And you can do all sorts of things. So this is kind of a nice, uh, nice story, and uh, you can uh, you can align it with an electric field. You can do all kinds of things. Okay, moving on to uh, liquid crystal elastomer photo actuators. Now, so as I mentioned, because of these energy considerations, applying an electric field to liquid crystal elastomer really doesn't do anything simply because the network has a stronger aligning effect than the electric field. <coughs> Heating has a big impact. Putting impurities in has a big impact. And it turns out that light has a really big impact because light can do one of two things. It can either heat the material, nice way of getting uh, energy in there, and it can also disrupt the order in another way that I'll talk about. So the optomechanical coupling goes like this. Light somehow changes orientational order. This gives rise to mechanical strain, and then you have a shape change. So that's the basis of photoactuation. And now how does, how does light change the order parameter? So we can do it in different ways. There's direct heating. Light is simply absorbed, linear absorption. You heat up the material, same as if you have the Bunsen burner under it. Uh, there's another very nice thing that one can do is one can put an azo uh, dies into the elastomer and these change shape from a long trans um, um, isomer uh, which kind of looks like a liquid crystal molecule to a really sharply bent cis one and this now looks like an impurity. So basically, when you shine light on an azo dye system, you are turning essentially liquid crystal molecules into impurities, which again changes the transition temperature, as we said before, and it, it's just the same as if you had heated the sample. So it's not heating, but in many ways, it's almost like a little heat. Uh, light can exert a direct optical torque of liquid crystals, and I mentioned this before when we talked about uh, torques yesterday. So that's one possibility. And then there are some really fascinating ways 
in which light can exert an indirect optical torque. And um, I'll talk about this uh, a little bit tomorrow. So there's lots of ways that light can uh, change the order parameter. And the first experiment to probe the effects of light uh, was by, uh, by uh, Mark Warner and Michael Finkelman, the co-workers. And what they did is they put an azo dye into the network. So they actually put covalently bond of the azo dye into the polymer network. And the effect of that is simply to pull the crosslinks uh, closer together when they irradiated it and this thing became bent rather than being extended. And so this is kind of the first experiment. And uh, by illuminating the sample with UV, uh, you get a big, uh, well, you get 20% contraction, not so dramatic. And it was fairly slow. This is an hour and a half heating and, I don't know, four hours relaxation time. So there's a significant effect, but it was kind of slow. Uh, but uh, then there was lots of, uh, lots of work in making other life responsive materials. This is made by uh, Tomiki Ikeda, who was at Tokyo Tech, and he made this uh, he made this costly material. And here, the interesting story is, is that um, the, it, it curls up when you shine light on it, and you can make it straighten out by shining uh, green light on it. This is UV, and you can control the axis about which it curls by controlling the polarization. And uh, Look something like this. I think it's going to be more time. And uh, what happens here is that this is a polydomain sample uh, that has some azo dye in it, and uh, only the domains which are aligned along the polarization direction uh, absorb the light. So it's only those guys whose dramatic director is along the polarization, and they're the ones that contract. That's why you have curling up um, along the direction perpendicular to the polarization. So these are kind of nice, and you can imagine you can make all sorts of interesting uh, devices for this. And then we uh, played around with this stuff as well. Basically, just put some azo dye into the elastomer just by dissolving the dye in a solvent, swelling the just putting the sample, the elastomer, into the, into the solvent. Uh, so all the solvent went in, then you take it out, evaporate the solvent, and now the dye is inside. And if you shine light on this from above, then you get uh, pretty, pretty strong and fast uh, actuation. So this is a little cantilever, five millimeters long. And then you can measure the you can measure the force uh, if you hold the end fixed. Measure the time, and so this is sort of uh, the relaxation time is 75 milliseconds. So you can get these things to work relatively quickly. Um, but then people have done uh, people have done other things. Uh, if you you can imagine that you have. Uh, piece of material which is lying down like this, and you shine light on it here, then it will contract on that side and it will fly up. Now you're shining light on this side, so it's going to fly up like that. And uh, so you can make these things so they will oscillate. And that can oscillate really fast. It's hundreds of hertz. Um, and this is work by uh, Nelson Taveria in uh, Florida. So you can make uh, Things are oscillating pretty fast, and they even had uh, they even had uh, material that worked in sunlight. So they just kind of lands and focus sunlight on it. And I think you can see that uh, you can get it from the oscillating. Uh. Okay, so this is some uh, photo-induced uh, bending, and. Uh, I think that the right pattern, some people are also interested in seeing whether you can make wings that uh, can move and provide lift. And uh, I'm not sure how far along they are. They're using particle model symmetry to, to try to track what happens. 
but I'm not sure how <coughs> how close they came to uh, getting something that would provide lift. On the other hand, we know that uh, these materials can swim, so we wanted to make a little uh, little light driven artificial goldfish. Uh, but it turns out that you have a fixed laser and the thing moves, so it's easier to hold the elastomer in place and see if it can pump water, which is kind of a problem. Yes? Well, on what depends the, the frequency of the potential? Uh, well, um, kind of everything. Uh, it, it, it depends on the um, intensity of light, which tells you how much contraction you will get, basically. And then the, the physical properties, the, the, the mass and the thickness of the sample, and so on. So you sort of have to think about, I mean, it, it's, it's relatively easy to figure out. You need to know how big the, the, uh, the stress is that you get, that you can calculate, and then apply that to the particular sample that you have in your um, Okay, so so we just put uh, put an elastomer in a, in a glass cell, and then we shine light on both sides. And you can see that, okay, it's really crude, but nonetheless it produces foam. So in principle, one could make a, one could make a swimmer this way. Okay, and then of course, um, um, in playing around with this stuff, um, we came across uh, with, uh, with Mike, it's really unusual phenomenon that if you, shot, if you float a sample on a, on a tub of water, and the density is just a little bit less than water, so it kind of uh, floats on top. And uh, we were looking for something completely different, but it turns out when you shine light from the top, the elastomer swims away from the light. Um, and that seemed pretty remarkable. shine light on it and the thing changes its shape and it swims away from the light. It's, it's quite amazing. Why does it do that? I want the other one to work. Ah, ah it works. Okay, so you shine light on it and it swims away from the light. When we first saw that, it was Unimaginable because there's no no momentum, right? Light is doing anything; it's pushing it down. And uh, here's another one, uh, just a little tiny uh, irregularly shaped sample. And uh, here's a light, and it just doesn't want to be under the light. Also, it's a very clear light. Okay. Yes. It might be just way off, but uh, I was wondering, is, are there any thoughts about using this as like an energy source? Like this Actually, an energy it, source. Yeah, using sunlight and then like, moon and kind of get energy out of it. Like, yeah, energy. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll say a few words about okay. some ideas, but I think there are many more that one could, one could imagine. Uh, so, about the swimming business, how does it work? Uh, so I think that um, it's, it's clear that, that, that somehow the motion is due to the transfer of energy, not momentum, because the only momentum that you have from light is, is momentum directed downward, not transverse. And uh, how does it work? Well, I think that we think that what happens is more as the following. So here's the sample, and you have some director. And then you shine light on it in this, then either because of heating or because of this uh, 
trances for isomerization of this order. This will contract along the pneumatic director. So you have a contraction along here. And then you have to an expansion in the other direction to conserve volume. So you, you make the saddle shape. And then now imagine that uh, you have some noise, you have some kind of displacement that moves this guy, let's say, in that direction. Then um, the laser will no longer be at the center, but it will be over here. And that means that the shoulders of the side of it will move backwards. And when they do that, they're going to push on the water. And the water is going to push on the elastomer. And this thing is just going to walk away. And so I think that there's instability. And the mechanism is kind of like the mechanism with which these back over fish and swim, essentially by propagating a wave uh, down along the temporal tendency. So, <coughs> Uh, you know, you know, the, the, the typical shape that you get is really similar to this in a way. So it looks like uh, this elastomer swims like a fish due to this intrinsic instability. So it's a kind of a light driven motor and uh, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Now there's other stuff that people have made. Uh, Dick Grower uh, at um, Eindhoven has uh, made these uh, really nice uh, artificial cilia, and uh, these things have two different dyes in them in different places, because to pump water you have to break Purcell's scallop theorem, you have to have non-reciprocal motion, and so by being able to bend these things in different places, uh, you, you, you can have kind of the power and the refraction stroke of these things. And they did it with an inkjet printer. So you, you can print these things, you just put your stuff into the inkjet printer and you print away. And then you can make arrays of these things and uh, it will work very nicely. Other stuff, um, uh, Rudolf Zantel in Mainz, uh, who's, uh, who's a chemist. Uh, made um, <coughs> sort of essentially using, uh, using this uh, standard trick of the weights group, uh, inject uh, the elastomer into fluid flow, making nice uniform bubbles, eventually crossing them, and uh, you have nice uh, identical uh, little, uh, little spheres, and then uh, at, uh, at some different temperature, uh, you can get. I think they were, these were made in the nomadic phase and in the isotropic phase. The so you can make them change shape, um, temperature, or light if you want. So ways of uh, ways of made mass producing these things. Uh, let's see. This is also some interesting stuff. Um, Helena Godinho in Lisbon uh, makes. Uh, cellulose liquid crystal elastomer. So it turns out that cellulose is both chiral and can make uh, liquid crystals. And so they were using electrospinning to make uh, liquid crystal elastomer fibers, which have sort of interesting mechanical properties. They, you know, they, they're responsive to stress uh, and they form these helical structures that can accommodate a wide range of uh, deformations. Okay, a few words about energy conversion. I mentioned yesterday that, uh, that if you just take the divergence of the dielectric tensor um, and it's not zero, then you must have electric polarization. And um, if you take an isotropic rubber sample and you deform it, uh, essentially nothing much happens because uh, because uh, you're conserving volume, and epsilon just goes to the volume, so you can deform it. Uh, this quantity ends up being zero. But the liquid crystal, that's not at all the case. You get uh, you get a huge uh, you get a huge contribution from uh, from changing uh, from the spatial variation of Q. And so, if you take, for example, uh, these banana-shaped molecules, which have dipole moments on them, 
which, which makes them really um, polarizable. And you bend these, then you have essentially giant ferro electricity. And that's one interesting possible way of making, uh, making energy. And, and this is just a sample that one of the students cobbled together. And you can see that you can get really pretty significant voltages just by flexing a piece of this material. Um, <clears throat> another possibility, uh, another way to make energy basically is to take a capacitor with a liquid crystal in between and put some charge in the capacitor plates. And now if you decrease the dielectric constant, the voltage has to go up. And so you can basically pump charge from a low voltage to a high voltage. And uh, the question is, how do you decrease the dielectric constant? And one way is just by heating up the liquid crystal. So just by either heating the liquid crystal or by straining an elastomer, you can pump charge up to a high voltage and make electrical energy. So <clears throat> that's one way of doing it. And it turns out that the breakdown uh, strength of the liquid elastomer is really high. And it turns out that if you put a liquid crystal elastomer in here and just use some, you know, use high electric fields, you can get uh, you can get efficiencies that are becoming comparable to solar cells. So you might be able to use this kind of generation to use sunlight basically to make relatively efficient energy generation. Okay. Now I want to take a few minutes to talk about modeling the dynamics of uh, magnetic elastomers. And uh, I, I don't want to put, I don't want to go through it in, 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 in too much detail, but the basic idea is, is that one has two variables. One is the displacement and the other is the crystal order. And uh, these are coupled somehow. And so kind of a general strategy to do dynamics is to uh, write down the, the free energy density somehow. We already had a version of it uh, already. And then, in addition to the free energy, one needs to look at uh, dissipation and forces and torques coming from dissipative processes. So one can write on the Rayleigh uh, dissipation function, which depends on generalized velocities or order parameter and, uh, and position. And uh, if you have both of these things, then you can uh, you can get the dynamics from the usual sort of Lagrangian formulation here by essentially, uh, essentially inquiring that the, uh, that the uh, variation of the action together with the contribution from the Rayleigh dissipation vanish. So you can get momentum conservation uh, from this equation here. And uh, you have, because you don't have inertia, basically you have non-conserved order parameter dynamics. This case, which is pretty pretty similar to that, except you don't have this thing. So <clears throat> this is a kind of a general structure that you can use in principle to describe pretty much the complete dynamics of uh, of the system. Now, what uh, is the free energy? So there's different uh, different ways of uh, calculating that. Um, <clears throat> One can use mean field theory, of course, which is, which is simple. But an issue that is of some concern is that the order parameters, of course, vary in space. And one has to put in the free energy cost of those spatial variations. And so then one says, OK, we can just put in all the symmetry allowed squared gradient terms. But that turns out to be a bad idea, because if one does that, one can end up with an ill-posed variational problem. There's a kind of a classic problem in liquid crystals called the K13 problem, which says that if you put in additional terms to the ones that I showed you uh, that still contain two gradient operators and two uh, directors, you can end up with an ill-posed problem. It's a kind of a classic problem, 
and uh, I've been, you know, people have written, I don't know, dozens and dozens of papers on it, and it's still somewhat uh, unresolved. So, but it's an interesting problem, and I'm happy to talk about it if anyone's interested. But the issue is that putting in all this criteria in terms may be a problem, so instead of doing that, we just thought we won't do it, we'll just use a non-vocal uh, non formalism where the energy cost of spatial heterogeneities is not expanded in some sort of Taylor uh, series or gradient expansion, but is kept uh, in this way. Okay, so elastic free energy, talked about this already. Um, one can then uh, write down the, the free energy that results from this. And so the notion is that one uses this uh, effective stat length um, tensor. And uh, okay, and again, I don't want to go into it. When you make the sample, you because you stretch it when you're doing the initial cross-linking, there tends to be a small amount of frozen in order. And if you want to do a complete description, you want to keep track of that as well. Uh, and then one can just write down the free energy in terms of a kernel and a distribution function. And uh, case of the kernel, which is a logarithm of the uh, of the distribution um, just looks like this. And yeah. so, yes? Excuse me, I didn't get what is the step length uh, a few slides before. Okay, so, so we're talking here about the separation between the ends of a polymer chain, which would be the location of the cross links. And in the isotropic rubber, you just do a random walk, taking steps of equal length in all directions, and you would end up uh, uh, basically with a, with a distribution which is isotropic. That is, that the distance, the probability of going in one direction a certain distance is just the same as in any other. But in the case of a liquid crystal, because the network contains these mesogenic units, if these are all aligned, then the probability of stepping in that direction is bigger than in the transverse direction. And this can be described by essentially putting, so the step length appears in the denominator. And so you can imagine that somehow you have a tensor that tells you how long your steps are along the dramatic director or perpendicular. So you make a step length tensor and because it's in the denominator, you have to take the inverse of it and you stick that up here. So that basically puts the anisotropy uh, into the distribution. And, and it's an important point because this is where liquid crystallinity couples to the rubber, couples to the elasticity. So this is that step length uh, answer here. So one can construct um, the, uh, the free energy um, for the rubber and for the liquid crystal is just the same as we had before and ex instead of putting gradient terms one can instead put in the non-vocal interaction which is basically the order parameter here somewhere else divided by 1 over r to the sixth which is what you would expect for typical uh, dispersion interactions. So <clears throat> just a a way of doing this without worrying about gradients. So one can have the um, free energy of the rubber, free energy of the crystal, and then this is the dissipation, but basically you just include all possible scalars you can make for velocity. So this is a liquid crystal, order parameter, varying against itself. Um, this is just the typical uh, dissipation due to the viscosity of uh, material flow and that these are cross terms where the order parameter couples to the velocity of the surrounding material. Uh, and of course things like viscosities will depend on Q but the lowest order one would not ignore that. So the description is, is, is relatively non-trivial but one can put all the pieces there, then stick it into the machinery I indicated at the beginning, 
and then you can get the uh, you can get the dynamics of the position as well as the dynamics of the order map. And uh, so this is kind of the framework. And then if you want to do the calculation for the fluid, which we have not done, then you would just have maybe your stones for the um, surrounding fluid, but usually the possibility and one region. Yes? So you have integrated out the apolar order parameter. The apolar order parameter dynamics is still there. So why there is no boundary condition on the apolar order parameter on the pneumatic director on the boundary? Ah, that's a good question. Well, what is what is the boundary condition on the order parameter at the boundary? So you would have to put in a surface term, just like what I talked about yesterday. Then you would have to say something about how the yes, order parameter and the surface couples to the surrounding medium. And, uh, and, uh, and we know what that should be, basically. I, mean, I didn't talk about it, but you just put the symmetry of our coupling term, Q uh, dotted with the surface normal twice. Right? And there's a coefficient, which, which we know what it is. So, and there's the experimental work to sort of verify that on, on typical liquid crystals, not so much on liquid crystal elastomers, but presumably one knows more or less what it is. So just put in that surface term, Q dot surface normal with the proper Okay, and so, uh, so that, that's the structural framework, and then Wei Zhu, who was uh, working with Michael de Kurat Institute, did. Uh, the numerical solution of these equations, although not the full blown version, just some approximation to it. And uh, I'll just illustrate some of his results. So this is uh, showing uh, the bending, sort of corresponding to the initial uh, light actuation that I mentioned. Uh, then um, we expect to see saddle shapes of things that are illuminated in the middle. And uh, so this is. Uh, kind of showing that the simulations give the same kind of deformation, the same saddle shape. Um, one interesting question is the following. Is it possible to take uh, a uniform a chiral sample? Could you induce spontaneous twist? And, uh, and that's kind of an interesting question. Now, you know that uh, if, if, if you go to, to Parties, not now, but in the 50s, maybe. People used to hang streamers of crepe paper. And they were twisted. You remember that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> old movies. And, and uh, you would stretch the edges of crepe paper. And if you have a strip of paper where the edges are too long, then the way to deal with that is to twist. Because right? the middle stays the same, but the outside edge is no longer. So the idea was to see if that would happen here. So the question is, if you contract the middle region here, that would make the edges too long, would you get a spontaneous twist? And it turns out that the answer is yes. So sometimes it twists one way, sometimes the other, but you can get this uh, spontaneous twist. OK, now that's quite a lot of modeling. Uh, a little bit of acid, there's a different aspect of it by Antonio Desimore, uh, Kenji Rayama, Tom Lubensky, uh, uh, Salinger's at Kent State, and Wei Zhu. And this uh, Wei Zhu's paper just uh, appeared very recently in his relief. We're interested in seeing more details. Okay, so that pretty much brings us to the end of the story for today. So, the key idea is that these elastomers combine features of uh, liquid crystals and, uh, and rubbers, um, and they couple orientation order and strain, and uh, their, their salient aspect is this really very, very um, impressive <coughs> responsivity to almost any kind of excitation. And modeling is a formidable problem, and uh, as you can see, some of that is on the way. Thank you. Please. Uh, 
So in the experiment where uh, the, the piece of uh, elastomer was uh, uh, swimming away from the light on the surface of the liquid, uh, did you consider the capillary forces acting on that, on that thing uh, when explaining the, the swimming? Not in any great detail. And, uh, and I have to say that um, we have this explanation, but we don't really have uh, a, a, a careful elimination of other mechanisms, sort of Marangoni effects may be relevant, you know, capillary forces. So it would be nice to really study that problem in more detail and try to better understand what happens. Because it, it's quite remarkable, even in this, you know, this funny oscillator thing. It doesn't seem to matter at all, you know, what the orientation is, what the shape is, nothing between this one and the other. Did you just take a piece of acid rubber and float it and illuminate it? Did it move? No. Sure. Okay. So that would say Marangoni doesn't seem to be alive. Well, but it didn't deform. So it may, you know, so it may be that... Well, okay. I, I agree. I'm, 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 you know, if I had to, if I had to choose, I would say it's not Marangoni. <laughs> nice, to, to choose. nice to do all these things. But on one thing we did was we put soap on the water. And we thought that by changing the surface properties, yeah, that, that's one thing we didn't do. We put, we put different kinds of detergents and surfactants on there, and the behavior was just the same. So it doesn't seem like it's really surface tension. So, I'm, I'm guessing you're uh, if you brought these actuators to a roboticist, they'd be interested in forces. So, do you know how the force density in these actuators compare to existing actuators? Uh, <coughs> I used to know. <laughs> uh, I think it just depends kind of on how hard you drive them. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can make you can make a crude estimate of the energy density just from the argument that we have these nomadic molecules with all that density and they have about KT. And so that gives a kind of a ballpark figure. So that and the cross-link density are the two issues. Okay. Or, yeah, well, you probably know more about the existing numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should chat. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Thank you. Thank you. So, the square, why the square gradient terms are a problem? So if we just include the frank free energy terms um, of, of the pneumatic, so is that a problem? Just including the frank. Just including yeah. the frank frame. No, the frank is not a problem. So it's the pro the stream, the, the gradients of stream is the problem. The <coughs> actually, even at the very beginning, Osin and Frank had two other terms which also involve two gradients and two ends, and they're called we had coefficients that they called K24 and K13. And uh, and the problem is, is, is with the K13 term and the essence of the K13 term that it looks like, um, that essentially it looks like N del squared N, maybe after a surface integration. After the integration by parts, you get this. Okay. And now, <coughs> this, it, it turns out that this is just bad. You, you, you try to take, try to make any energy functional that has the form try to make any energy functional say that has the form of uh, y squared plus something times uh, y del squared y dx and try to minimize it. And it turns out that you get into a bad situation, you get a differential equation that doesn't have enough uh, constants of integration to satisfy the boundary condition. And, uh, and, and really, so, so, so this is basically the heart of the problem. And, uh, and still, you know, people don't know how to deal with it. <laughs> Some people say, don't put it in there. <laughs> there's, there's a story of Crookes, you know, Michael, not, not Michael, Crookes, Crookes, uh, German physicist who who invented the Crookes tube, although the name is English. Crookes tube was an old 
whole thing, but you have the electron beam and some metal, and you've got some energy. And uh, he had a technician, and the technician came to him and said, uh, you know, every time I put the pitch blend next to the film in the desk jar, the film becomes foggy. And this was just before the discovery of radioactivity. And Crook said to the technician, you know, don't put it in there. <laughs> so, right, so he missed the Nobel Prize. And so, but to some extent, it's the same situation here, right? That, uh, people say, don't put it in there. But I mean, I think, that's, I think it's a fundamentally interesting problem. And it would be good to, good to have it solved. Right? Great. Thanks.